My name is Joseph Parnas. I am a psychiatrist and a professor of psychiatry at the University of Copenhagen. And the topic of this uh, short lecture, hopefully, um, is the issue of insight into illness in schizophrenia and the related issue of something which is called double bookkeeping. So to start uh, in some general terms, schizophrenia is frequently a disorder associated with the so-called psychotic symptoms. And psychotic symptoms are considered as a sort of emblematic form of irrationality. So having a delusion is an emblematic sign of being in a condition of complete irrationality. The notion of insight is especially important in a forensic context, but also in the treatment context. So the typical treatment of psychotic illness with antipsychotic drugs, for example, has as it, its purpose to bring the patient into the condition of insight into illness, make him aware that he is sick. And the definition of insight in the DSM is awareness of illness awareness of having symptoms and signs and consequences, social other consequences of one's illness. And one uh, characteristic feature of schizophrenia is that there is what is called a lack of insight. The patients often fail to realize that they are psychotic or that they are ex their experiences are psychotic, delusional, and so forth. So uh, there are different theories about uh, why the psychotic patient uh, does not have insight into his illness. And basically, there are two approaches. One approach is a cognitive approach which postulates that there is some sort of metacognitive module that is malfunctioning and prevents the patient to gain an insight into his illness. In other words, the, the idea is the following, that you have symptoms or signs, but you have a sort of a meta move of consciousness, which sort of bends itself over itself and then looks down and sees the symptom as a sign of illness. And this is metacognitive move exerted by some sort of metacognitive module in the frontal lobes. So the idea here is that this metacognitive move doesn't work properly in schizophrenia. A second approach is to say that, uh, from inspired by the psychoanalytic approach, is to say that the lack of insight is a sort of denial of illness, that it is more or less a sort of defensive reaction. And there are all kinds of other variants of these two positions. So when we talk about <clears throat> psychosis and we talk about delusions in schizophrenia, we usually take delusions to be emblematic of lack of rationality. And the rationality is difficult to, to specify and define, but we all have, uh, I mean, it's a sort of intersubjective tacit consensus of what is reasonable, what is likely, what is unlikely, what is true, what is false. And irrationality is a condition in which we violate all those axioms of ordinary life. So let us say that we have a patient 
who has the idea that his apartment is invaded by some insects, some parasites, and he's going to his own GP and complaining of a skin rash and some somatic symptoms which he ascribes to the parasites. And then the doctor says, well, no, it's unlikely. Then the patient sort of writes a complaint about the doctor. Then there are certain commissions from the Technological Institute to inspect his apartment. They do not find par parasites. And one day the patient comes to his GP with a matchbox filled with some dirt as a sort of proof of the existence of the parasites. And the doctor says, well, it, it doesn't look like parasites. So finally, the, the patient makes a complaint about conspiracy between the GP, between the Technological Institute, between the municipal uh, authorities, and so forth. And here we have a clear-cut example of delusion, of a paranoia or delusional disorder. Um, but what is interesting about this delusion is that it, all, it is all sort of located in our shared intersubjective world. Because the patient is referring to his apartment, which is invaded by the parasites. He is referring to parasites to which he ascribes objective existence. He is eager to convince his interlocutor, in this case uh, the GP, of the existence of those parasites. And he's in conflict with the surrounding world about the issue of the parasite. Of course, we have to admit that it is perhaps there is something more to the condition of the patient than the only question of parasites or not. Maybe his mental apparatus and his psychological life is more deeply disturbed than, uh, than we can imagine from the single example of the parasite. But nonetheless, the whole issue for this patient is sort of taking place in the shared intersubjective world. And this kind of delusion, which may also occur in schizophrenia and not only in delusional disorder, we would call the empirical delusion because the delusional content and the structure of the delusion is concerned with our mundane, everyday world where the patient claims certain things are happening and we, as observers or listeners, say, no, this is not true. In schizophrenia, however, we have very often to do with delusions which we cannot call for empirical delusions, but which more appropriately should be called ontological delusions, which means that these delusions are not concerned with empirical matters in our shared intersubjective world. They are concerned with matters which are linked to the patient's private first personal experience and which have a reality for the patient which is a reality not of the objective kind, but which is a reality assured by the first personal experience. And this applies to delusions, and we call them, as I said, ontological delusions, but that applies also to phenomena such as hallucinations and influence phenomena, the point 
at stake here to understand is that basically patient's evidence is of a irrefutable private kind. And to use an analogy, if I have a pain in my knee, for example, there is no external evidence in the empirical world that can convince me that I am not in pain. So if I say to you, I am in pain, and you say to me, no, you are mistaken, then we do not speak the same language, because then it shows that you have not understood what the pain means, what, what is the notion of pain. The important thing to realize for the doctor, and this is very frequently not realized, that when the patient presents his delusions, it may seem that he's talking about the external shared world, but in fact he's talking about his private experience. This leads to a situation which is called by Bloiler, double bookkeeping. It is not the term, a term which is invented by Bloiler, but used by Bloiler, which means that the patient lives in, in a sort of two registers of reality. One, a sort of shared objective reality, and another one, which is a private and non, for the patient, nonetheless, objective reality. A classic example of this situation of double bookkeeping may be taken from Daniel Paul Schreber, a very famous judge who developed schizophrenia and was committed to an asylum, and who, who wrote his memoirs of his mental illness in the beginning of 20th century. And in this book he writes, uh, I can even say with Jesus Christ, my kingdom is not of this world. And then he describes all kinds of abnormal experiences and he says these experiences reflect my communication with the divine and not uh, matters of the empirical world. Another very good example of this sort of situation is a French patient of a very famous French psychologist, Pierre Janet, whose name is Madeleine, and who used to walk on her tiptoes because she felt that she had a divine ascension and, and divine status. And Jeanne told her once, well, <clears throat> if you were truly divine, you should be some centimeters above the earth, above the, the earth. And she looks at him and says, what a crazy idea to apply metric measures to divine issues. So you have here again this sort of collision between the idea of a, an objective empirical world and the private world of the patient. What is important to understand in this connection that it is not the question of fantasy on the part of the patient. It is a question of something which is called a self-affection, and I will try to explain it in the following way. When we talk about our patient with the parasites invading his apartment, we are talking about an experience and his delusion as a kind of typical intentional experience, which means that there is a sort of subject-object correlation in this experience. There is a subject claiming that there are parasites, and there is a, a subject-object correlation, and there is some distance between the self of the patient and the theme 
and the experience of delusion. So this is a classic intentional relation. In, in terms of ontological delusions or hallucinations, the development of these morbid phenomena happens in another way. One of the characteristic features of the schizophrenia spectrum patients is the phenomenon of Andersein, which means feeling different. And it means that the patient typically already since childhood has felt being different from other people and being different in a very fundamental way in his existence, in his being in the world, which means that he has felt and feels that the way his mentality functions and his position in the world functions is in a certain way radically different from other people. So this feeling of difference usually precedes what the patient thematizes as being different. So the feeling of difference precedes finding out what is different. This feeling of difference may be related to some other disorders of selfhood, where the patient may have some solipsistic insight into the true nature of reality. And this undersign is one of the features of the disorder self in schizophrenia. So what happens in the development of the ontological delusions or development of hallucinations is not a psychological event which has a clear intentional subject-object structure. Rather, what happens in the development of these delusions and hallucinations is something which happens within the selfhood of the patient where the part of the self becomes sort of disconnected from the self and becomes an other. This is a process called as alterization by French psychiatrists. And it is a process which, as I said, does not have true or intentional structure but rather a process in which the self sort of bursts out, out in, in a sort of disintegration. And it is a process which we can compare to the phenomenon of revelation. So it's not a sort of knowledge acquired from the external world, but it's a revelation within one's own subjectivity. And this revelation has a phenomenological character of self-affection in the same way as pain is a self-affection, as a mood is a self-affection, which means that there is no distance between the self and this which affects, so to say. The self affects itself and there is no doubt possible in experiencing this self-affection. One way of illustrating this lack of doubt and this conviction of the patient is to go to Descartes, who has a very famous passage in which he writes the following, I am asleep, but I dream that I feel warmth, sound, and I see something. But I am asleep, so all this must be false. But nonetheless, at least it seems to me that I see, hear, and feel warmth. So this seeming is something which cannot be doubted. Of course, it's not true that he's seeing something because he's asleep. But it is true that it seems to him 
that he's seeing something. And this seeming is the essence of the self-affection or auto-affection. So the development of delusions and hallucinations in schizophrenia has another character and nature than development of empirical delusions, which can be classified as false beliefs about reality, but the ontological delusions have another reality status for the patient, and what the patient tries to do is to negotiate through double bookkeeping some sort of coexistence of the empirical world and his private ontology. Thank you.